It is time for my favorite segment here on the Unafraid Show. It is mailbag time. That's where you get to get your questions answered that you sent in to at George Reister, at Unafraid Show, or emailed us in at I'm Mad, I M M A D, at unafraidshow.com. So send them in, and yours just might make the show. So, first up, I love when you guys call me to the mat and try to keep me accountable for things that I said. And I told you guys earlier this year that Arch Manning was on Quinn Ewers' bumper. And that if there was any slip in this offense, that you could see Arch Manning replace Quinn Ewers. But Quinn Ewers went out there to Michigan, big win. And that led to this question. You have said that Arch Manning is on Quinn Ewers' heels. Did Ewers' performance against Michigan buy him any breathing room? The answer is yes, resounding yes, but not as much as you would think. It's bought him one game of breathing room because Texas's next three opponents are UTSA, Louisiana Monroe, and Mississippi State, and all are at home in Austin. So good chances are that those are going to be blowout games and Arch gets some garbage time reps. And if he looks great, and the next two games after that are the Red River rivalry against Oklahoma and then Georgia at home. So Quinn's got one game that if he plays poorly in the Oklahoma game, the Red River rivalry, then you could see Arch playing against Georgia. And then if he plays poorly against Georgia, then you could see some Arch after that. So he going up to the big house has shown and winning in Tuscaloosa last year that he should be trusted. And no player is perfect, so he's not going to have a perfect slate, but he has bought himself a little bit of rope. Second question up, fair or foul? Nebraska players dancing to Shador Sanders' song, Perfect Timing, in the locker room after beating Colorado. I'll let y'all watch. That is 100% fair. To the winner go the spoils. If you want to be a celebrity, you want to make songs, you want to, you know, do the Shadour and everything else, you got to be able to take it on the back end and people are going to be ready to troll you. And they already had this plan and I'm not mad at it. In fact, I love it. To the winner, winners can do what they want. Who are we blaming for Notre Dame's loss to Northern Illinois? Wow, that's a that's a loaded question right there. You can lay this Northern Illinois loss squarely at the feet of their head coach, Marcus Freeman, because the buck stops with him. Now, it is his job to make sure that he's putting a competent offense on the field and their offense has not looked great. And if we're being honest, even in that big win in Kyle Field against Texas A&M in week one, the offense didn't look that great. But we attributed some of that to Mike Elko, Texas A&M head coach, knowing his quarterback in Riley Leonard and being able to put some things together to be able to stop him. But now against Northern Illinois at home, a game that you were supposed to knock the doors off of them, not being able to move the ball, your quarterback throwing two picks, no touchdowns, that is a dramatic issue. And so, yes, it's the coach's fault in terms of he's the one who has to fix it. But he did do a good job of protecting his young quarterback when he said, well, excuse me, not his young quarterback because uh, Riley Leonard is not young by college football standards, but his quarterback. And he said, quote, um, every person in here, every coach has to own it and not blame anybody else. And that's the way we're going to fix it is when every person outside of here will try to point the finger at some coach, some player, some person. It should be at the head coach. It's my job. But we all have to own this and we all have to really take a deep dive and fix it. 100% right. You know Notre Dame fans are going to have their pitchforks out right now because their last head coach, Brian Kelly, he ended his time at Notre Dame on a 40-game win streak against unranked opponents. And now Marcus Freeman has lost not one, not two, but three games against unranked teams at home. Not on the road, but at home as huge favors. They just lost to Northern Illinois. They lost to Marshall last year, and they lost to a 3-9 and nine Stanford team. Uh, that's not going to cut it. So, yes, it is Marcus Freeman's fault. Are we still believing in Marcus Freeman? Yes, 
but he got to have some answers. Next question up. And I think that this is a very, very fair question because I was thinking about it over the weekend too, about the Oregon Ducks, because they've been much maligned about a 24 to 14 victory over Idaho and the Boise State team, which clearly looks really good as the best running back in the country. Idaho beat Wyoming. That's an FCS school beating an FBS school in Laramie. So that's on the road. And Boise State seems to be the best G5 team in the country. Are the Ducks legit or not? That's a legitimate question because apparently they have played stiffer competition than what it looks like on the outside. Because Boise State may just be the team that makes the college football playoff. Because remember prior to the season, I originally wanted to pick Boise State to make it to the college football playoff. But I said that they play Oregon. And if Oregon knocks their doors off, then that's going to make it tough for them to get in as the highest ranked group of five team. But now that they push the Ducks to the limit, now people are going to be saying the committee is going to say, especially if the Ducks went out and looked good, we be like, oh, this Boise State team is really good. That's a quality loss. So I think it's still up in the air about Oregon. Their defense is legit. Their special teams in terms of kickoff return looks great. But we got to find out if they are a championship contending team after they play Oregon State this upcoming week and then when they get into Big Ten schedule. Because the game that everybody's been looking forward to is that October 12th game against Ohio State. And if they can get there undefeated and it be a great game, then we'll know this team's for real. Cam Rising spent the second half of Utah's win against Baylor in street clothes with his finger wrapped up. Utah was very secretive about his injury last year. And do we think Rising is okay? And if he isn't, is Utah season over? That's a loaded question because first of all, 100% right. They were pretending through the first three or four games last year. Oh, Cam Rising, he'll be back at some point in time. Do miss the entire year last year. So we do know that Utah will do that. But it is highly concerning that even though they were up 23 to nothing, that Cam Rising, that he finished the game in street clothes. Not that his hand was wrapped up, that he finished the game in street clothes. So now you're looking at this saying, wait, hold up. That means he couldn't have came back in the game if something had, had happened to their freshman. Who is their backup? Isaac Wilson. Yes, related to Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson's brother, Isaac Wilson. And Isaac Wilson was a stat stuffing machine at Corner Canyon High School in Utah. But their quarterbacks from that high school have needed some serious development at the college ranks and weren't ready to play immediately. Like his brother, Zach Wilson at BYU, Devin Brown over at Ohio State, Jackson Dart at Ole Miss, and now you got Isaac Wilson. So you can't expect him to be ready to compete at a team that is supposed to win the Big 12 and be a college football playoff contender. So yes, Utah could have major struggles if Cam Rising misses significant time. Next question up. <clears throat> Feels good to be right. <laughs> he says, good call on Tennessee being good right away with Nico Iamalava, but are they more than good? That was a 41-point beatdown of a ranked team in NC State. Tennessee's last three recruiting class rankings, according to 247, are 17, 10, and 14. And then their total incoming transfers for the last three years are ranked 8, 8, and 9. So they haven't been overly reliant on the portal. They have been mainly building through high school and NIL. Yes, they have been putting a lot of money out, but they're the opposite of Colorado where yes, they've been putting money out, but it's been high school recruiting that is driving this entire team. So uh, yes, this team is better than good right now. They are very good. Now, are they a national championship caliber team? I don't know yet. Their defense though? Ooh, this defense held NC State to 149 yards of total offense. That's incredible play right there. So that's going to give them a shot against Alabama. It's going to give them a shot against everybody on their schedule. And I am more excited about this Tennessee team. Now, are they better than good? Yes, they're very good. But are they elite? I'm reserving that for a little bit later in the season. This next question up, I'm excited about. We were told Kansas State and Oklahoma would be better off letting Dylan Gabriel 
and Will Howard go so that their backups and young players would elevate their programs to the next level. Considering both schools are competing and trying to make the college football playoff, does it look like either school made a mistake? Hmm, I maybe Kansas State. Now, Avery Johnson has not been bad by any stretch of the imagination. He is 29 for 44, 334 yards, four touchdowns, and an interception, along with 77 yards rushing. So that in no way, shape, form, or fashion is bad. But it has not been as good as what you're getting out of Will Howard, who is a veteran and super experienced. Now he's thrown for over 500 yards this season, no interceptions, and he's got a rushing touchdown as well. So it takes a while to get your quarterbacks up to speed with their young guys. But as long as you don't lose a game, <laughs> yes, the fans over at Kansas State will be happy and excited. Now on the Oklahoma side, they replaced Dylan Gabriel with Jackson Arnold. The young guy's doing pretty good, but this last game against Houston <laughs> left a little bit to be desired and they may be calling for Dylan Gabriel, but at the end of the day, you gotta let young kids grow and not just try to just replace them with somebody out of the transfer portal. How wild is it that Arizona has the longest winning streak in the country? Do you remember how bad they were in the Kevin Sumlin years? <laughs> that is incredible that that is a true stat because three years ago, Arizona was in the middle of a 20 game losing streak and they went one and 11. And now the Wildcats own the longest active winning streak in college football. Now that Michigan has lost, how is that even possible? And truth be told that one in 11 was suspect anyway, because Cal shouldn't have even traveled to Arizona to play that game during COVID. And I know that Arizona fans, they're never going to show gratitude to Jed Fish because they feel like that he's a, a left in the cover of night. But he deserves a lot of credit for building that program. And he's put their new head coach, Brennan, in a very advantageous position because he actually might make Arizona the premier Big 12 destination for California kids and really kick things off over there at Arizona. And that is exactly why I picked them to be a top four team in the Big 12 over the next five years. Which ranked team losing surprised you the most? Georgia Tech to Syracuse, Iowa to Iowa State, or Kansas to Illinois? For me, the biggest surprise was Kansas losing to Illinois because I already said about Georgia Tech, we didn't quite know because of that Florida State game and how good or bad Florida State is. But Georgia Tech's pass defense had been untested throughout the year so far through the first two games. And then when you look at the Iowa-Iowa State game, if you're playing games that are that close where you don't blow people out ever, then yes, you're going to lose some of those games. And when your coach Kirk Ferentz literally plays prevent offense, that causes you an opportunity to lose because he ran a toss play on third and eight with a minute and 20 seconds left in the game instead of going for the first down and winning with the ball in his hands because it wasn't even trusting our defense because the defense takes the field either way and either with one minute left after a punt or 30 seconds left it's not a good strategy you cannot play not to lose you got to play to win now kansas they nearly won despite four turnovers and you ain't gonna win a whole lot of games with four turnovers. But even bigger than the game, the biggest surprise might actually be that Illinois Xavier Scott is a star. Last question up. <laughs> the Pac-2 is undefeated. And Oregon State has Washington. And Washington State has Washington this week. Which school should be on upset alert? And do you think it's possible for a Pac-2 team to make the college football playoff? Yes, I do think it is possible for a Pac-2 team to make the college football playoff. It would entail Oregon State beating Oregon or Washington State beating Washington. Now, should they both be on upset alert? 100%. Have you watched college football this year? Anybody is on upset alert every single week, except maybe Texas and Georgia. That's it. You have to bring your game every week. There's no more throwing your helmets out on the field and winning, throwing your jerseys out on the field and winning. You have 
to play to the zeros. Washington State also plays Boise State on September 28th. And Oregon State plays Washington State on November 23rd. So if Washington State can beat Boise State and beat Washington, and then Oregon State beats Oregon, and then Washington State or whoever wins that game on November 23rd, yes, that will be a college football playoff invitation and blow up everything that the committee and everybody is talking about. But let's pray that that doesn't happen to the Ducks. Maybe Washington. <laughs> no, nah, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but you guys, this is Unafraid Show Mailbag. Make sure that you send your questions in. I'm Matt. I-M-M-A-D at unafraidshow.com. And catch you with the questions next week.